Hello everyone, this is John Mark Johnson Jr. again, and this is going to be the second lecture series from the large print edition, that is the first large print edition of S.W.O.R.D. Now, S.W.O.R.D., if you caught the intro, you would know that it is an overview of the transmission canonization, contents, doctrines, textual reliability, and Christ's view of the Bible. So basically, it's the Bible in a book. We're talking about the Bible, we're talking about a lot of the things that are related to the Bible, how it came down to us, what is in the Bible and what isn't, all those kinds of things. And today we're going to be going into the first chapter of the book. Now this is the lecture series, this is not actually through the book itself, and so there's lots of material that I'm going to skip over and condense down, briefly mention those kinds of things. and so. Don't expect necessarily a play-by-play, -play, but I am going to hit a lot of the highlights. In particular, this chapter, called An Introduction to the Bible, is going to discuss three major topics. First, why use the term canon? Second, isn't the primacy of the canon a recently created doctrine? And third, what is the definition of the canon? So basically we're starting out with a series of questions. Questions that kind of set um, the back drop for the rest of the book. That first question, why use the term canon, is especially important because as we're about to find out, um, the idea of referring to the Bible as a particular document is actually a very vague thing. Um, and so if you're going to talk about it in a rigorous way, you want something that's more definitive. Um, this is not to say that Bible cannot necessarily be used. Lots of people do use it, but if you want to talk about something in a fairly rigorous, fairly academic way, you need to be specific about what you mean. A canon is more specific. There is a little bit of vagueness with that term as well, and if we have time we'll cover that, but it is more specific than Bible is. And uh, this is also just a general problem that I see, especially in Protestants, but the Eastern Orthodox, the Catholics, and non-Christians um, you know, they all make the all some mistakes, not necessarily every single one of them, but ones in each group will make mistakes regarding the terminology that we use when we talk about the Bible. And so that first section is basically just that, it's getting the terminology straight. Um, that second question, isn't the primacy of the canon a recently created doctrine? In the book I go into quite a bit of detail on that. There's uh, a number of pages devoted to that, not a ton, but a few pages that are devoted to that question. And from a Protestant perspective, it is a very important question. For the average person who's approaching the topic, it might not be so much of an issue one way or the other. Uh, that just kind of depends. But from a biblical historical point of view, and I am a biblical historical Christian, it is a fairly uh, major thing to consider. So the book goes into it in a lot of detail. Here, though, I'm just going to sum uh, summarize it with one slide. Um, there's more that could be said, obviously, and if you want the rest of it, go ahead and read the book. But the main point can be summarized in one slide. Uh, and then the final question, what is the definition of the canon, is not a very important thing. And in the introductory material, that is the lecture before this one, um, I discussed that there's lots of different ways that people define uh, Holy Scripture. Um, and uh, that, um, and some of those definitions, frankly, are just kind of either self-contradictory or they're not consistent with history, etc., etc., etc. So the definition that we're going to put forward here is one that strives to be consistent with history, that strives to be consistent with the text, and so on and so forth. What is it that I actually mean, and can we be fairly definitive about that? Not necessarily that we have to have every little detail defined in every single way, um, but we do need to have a fairly clear concept of what's going on. And so a definition that is historically tenable, that is functional, um, that is definitive, that is not implicitly self-contradictory, so on and so forth, would be a good thing to have. If you're going to claim to be a biblical historical Christian, you better have a good reason for putting the Bible as your first standard um, and being able to identify it as your first standard without some kind of external source. So those are the kinds of questions that we're going to be dealing with. So let's go ahead and get into this. First a section, that question of why use the term canon. We are going to look at four definitions. 
that are important to this topic. They are the definition of Orthodox Scripture, the definition, the definition of Ecclesiastical Scripture, Canonical Scripture, and Apocryphal Scripture. All right, so first, Orthodox and Ecclesiastical Scripture. If you're reading the large print edition, that's on pages 1 uh, through 3. Orthodox Scripture. Um, we wouldn't necessarily, that is, biblical historical Christians in general, and Protestants especially in general, when we think of Scripture, we do not necessarily think of this category. But this is technically a category. Scripture, the word in and of itself, is actually a very generic term, which basically just means something that's been written. And so the first category that we're going to encounter is a very general category, Orthodox Scripture. And what it basically means is that it's pro-faith. It's from the Christian worldview, more or less. Very, very, very general. Um, it's from the Greek words orthos and doxa, meaning right glory or correct worship, uh, depending on how you translate it. But basically, it's from the correct point of view. It's from the correct worldview. Um, an example that the modern Protestant might be able to sympathize with to a certain extent would be a Christian bookstore. Now, I know that Christian bookstores, you know, they're <laughs> definitely not as popular as they used to be. Amazon has kind of killed a lot of bookstores. Um, and also, Christianity is waning in America. And so, there's that as well. Um, but you can kind of think of it in terms of a Christian bookstore. If you go into a Christian bookstore, you would expect that at least the vast majority of the books that you'd be looking at would be Christian books in a sense. That doesn't necessarily mean that they're used to guide the faith. It doesn't mean that they're necessarily the, the principal books of the faith, but they are books that the faith has produced in a sense and that uh, are associated with the faith. And that is just as true now that Christians have a lot of books that are not necessarily uh, included in their Bible, that are their sacred works, but they still have a lot of works, and that's true now, and it was also true in the past. So, for example, in the past, you would have things like the Vision of Paul. That was written uh, late 4th century. You'd have the Infancy Gospels. They go back even further than that. They're about 2nd century. Um, and these are ones that do not typically get talked about all that much um, in in the uh, in the the actual services of the faith. It's very rare that these things would come up, which isn't to say that they don't come up at all, but it's very rare. It's not a regular part of a church service for pretty much any group. There are some groups that do actually use them as a part of their church services, but still, generally the rare occasion. These things instead are usually stuff that is looked at independently. They're looked at privately. They're not usually considered a, a part of the communal aspect of worship. They're not regularly, use, regularly used by the assembly. Uh, a more modern example could be, say, the, the Chronicles of Narnia, written by C.S. Lewis. That is something that a lot of Christians are aware of, a lot of Protestants are aware of, and a lot of them have even read it. However, that doesn't necessarily mean that you'd expect to hear a sermon preached on it. And if you went to a study group, you wouldn't necessarily expect the study group to be going over the Chronicles of Narnia. That may happen, but it certainly wouldn't be typical. So that's Orthodox Scripture. It's Christian in a basic sense, but it's not necessarily used by the church. Ecclesiastical Scripture is kind of a step up from that. It is used in the assembly. Um, and that's actually what the uh, the Greek word ecclesia, from which we get ecclesiastical, actually basically means. It basically means assembly. So if it's used in the assembly, it's ecclesiastical. That is, do people in the church, as a part of actual church functions and use, actually make use of these kinds of things for one purpose or another? And that would be ecclesiastical scripture. And this is where a little bit of the vagueness uh, comes in. That is, if you start talking about the Bible in the historic sense, that would actually be ecclesiastical scripture, what is used by the church. And frankly, churches have their own uh, sets of books that they use, and they will vary from place to place. And because of that, Bible in the ancient sense, with a, a lowercase b, will also vary as well. Bible. Um, 
comes from the words biblia, biblion, depending on if you're talking about the Latin or the Greek. Um, and it basically means a record or more uh, precisely a, a set that belongs to a particular record, so kind of like a record of records. Um, and the whole idea there is that this is the record of what we use here. And of course, the here could be any church scattered throughout the world. Um, and of course, in the ancient world, that would be primarily the Roman Empire. And so it wasn't necessarily a, a very fixed thing. It could vary a little bit. Uh, for example, the infancy gospels are sometimes included among the ecclesiastical works. Uh, for example, the Greek Orthodox Church will still use the Proto-Evangelion of James from time to time. Uh, the Shepherd of Hermas uh, was one that was fairly popular early on. It was pretty well known to a lot of uh, the early church fathers, but uh, doesn't really get tend, tend to be mentioned anymore. And as we go through uh, the book uh, Sword, um, we'll talk about why that is in a little bit more detail later on. Uh, another example could be the Apocrypha. The Apocrypha, if you're using the capital T on the the there, if you're actually referring to that particular set of documents, um, is a Protestant designation for the books that the Catholics use as a part of their Bible that we don't. From the Protestant perspective, those books would at best be considered ecclesiastical because they are things that could be referred to in the church services and they are things that have been used by the assembly in times past, but they're not necessarily considered authoritative. Um, a more modern example, for, especially for a Protestant, could be like the works of Charles Spurgeon. Those you could reasonably expect to be hear, heard in a, in a sermon or two, um, certainly more so than the Chronicles of Narnia, but at the same time they're not necessarily all that authoritative regarding the faith. And so you see a little bit of the dilemma that we have here. Ecclesiastical is basically defined by use. And because it's defined by use, it is going to vary from group to group. And this is the reason why you see different Bibles in different group, uh, Christian groups. It's because different Christian groups use different um, uh, sets of books. And if we were to apply that same kind of definition within Protestantism, it would vary considerably more because there's lots of books that Protestants use um, that, frankly, can just be kind of all over the place. I mean, we've mentioned the works of Charles Spurgeon here, but you could also add works of those uh, like James White. You could talk about Rabbi Zacharias. You could talk about, oh, uh, was it Jonathan Taylor? I can't remember at the moment, but all these people in the past that you could be talking about that could reasonably be used by a particular assembly, a particular church. Um, and because of that, there's going to be a fair amount of variety when it comes to that. And when you look at the major differences between Bibles, between different Christian groups, whether it be the Eastern Orthodox, whether it be the Catholics, whether it be the Protestants, uh, whether it be uh, the Ethiopic Church, whether uh, it be the Assyrian Church, so on and so forth, most of the differences, not all of them, but most of the differences are in the ecclesiastical category. They're not necessarily things that are always considered all that authoritative, but uh, they are nonetheless used. And this is something that is hard, especially for Protestants to wrap their head around. The idea that Christians would have a set of books that we don't necessarily consider to be equal in authority, but we still use them. And Protestants actually do this. We have books that we refer to that are not necessarily in our Bibles that we take with us to church on Sunday morning, but you'll still hear them talked about on Sunday morning. And like I said, they could be works like like those by Rabbi Zacharias and James White and um, insert various Christian author here. We do actually think of scripture this way as having levels of authority and levels of usefulness. But uh, for some reason, when we throw that word Bible in there, especially for Protestants, we think of it as a very fixed and rigid thing. And historically, that term Bible didn't necessarily refer to something that was fixed and rigid. It referred mostly to the record of what is, what is uh, permitted to be used in a particular area. Alright, so these are very general terms and they're also somewhat fluidic. 
and because of that it produces problems if you actually want to talk about it in, a, in an organized and definite way. So let's move on from there. The next category that we'll talk about is canonical scripture. Okay. Canonical scripture is much more useful. It particularly refers to that which guides the assembly. It comes from the Greek word kanon, which means a measuring rule or some kind of a standard, some kind of a standard of measurement in particular. Something that you can compare something to, judge something against. Now, to be fair, there are other uses of this term that do show up in the early church fathers. Um, one particularly interesting use of canon is that it can, in a very general sense, mean what is allowed. And you could probably make a pretty decent argument that some of the church fathers who included things in the canon that Protestants don't meant that these things are allowable. That's an argument that could be made. It's not necessary for the, the biblical historical perspective, but it is worth noting that that is uh, a variant of that word that is, that is useful. Now, in the context of what we're talking about in the book Sword, though, and what I'm talking about in these lectures, we're going to use the more restrictive definition of being a measuring rule or a standard, something that guides the assembly, something that acts as a standard for the assembly, for the Christian people, for the church. Um, examples uh, for these kinds of books are fairly uh, famous. For example, in the Old Testament, there would, of course, be the book of Genesis. That's the first book of the Old Testament. Uh, in the New Testament, we would have Matthew, first book of the New Testament. Uh, those are very clearly canonical. Christians, by and large, um, the world over, uh, agree on these books being a part of our standard works. They are, are works that do have a guiding capacity. Now, just how far that guiding capacity extends will differ from gr group to group. Uh, some people put that guidance within the confines of the interpretation of the church institution. Some of them see it as into being independent of the church institution, so on and so forth. But all of them can agree that there are certain books um, that are standard. You're not going to mess with them. They're not going to change. They don't fluctuate much. In the Wikipedia article on the Bible, it talks about a there being a largely common core to scripture, and that would basically be the canon. There are parts that fluctuate, those parts that are in the orthodox scriptures, those parts that are in the ecclesiastical scriptures, but there's also a part that pretty much no matter where you look in church history, you're going to find a fairly consistent record of, and that is what we would basically refer to as, uh, refer to as being canonical. We'll get a more specific definition here in a few moments, but for right now, that's basically what we're talking about. It's authoritative, it's standard, it is what we measure ourselves by, so on and so forth. Now, another uh, definition of scripture that is useful to know, especially if you're going to be reading through a lot of the ancient church fathers, is the term apocryphal. The term apocryphal is used by the ancient church fathers basically means that something is untrue or unreliable. And it would be hard to prove this in an absolute sense, but given the historical context, it was probably a response to Gnosticism. Uh, Gnosticism was a belief system that basically parroted a lot of Christian teachings, but added a lot of stuff of their own. And what they said about their own stuff was that, well, there were these secret teachings of Christ that we have knowledge of that you guys don't have knowledge of. and that's why we believe the different things that you and then you do because we have more than you we have the real stuff it had but it had been kept secret and hidden from you guys and that's what the greek word apocryphos means or apocryphos uh, means it means something that has been kept hidden or secret you look through a lot of the early christian writings that write in response to gnosticism and they are very adamant about saying uh, we don't have any secret writings we don't have anything that's um, been hidden away, locked up somewhere for the elite people. Our religion is for everyone. The message of the gospel is for everyone. It is not something that it is elitist. It is not something that requires secret knowledge and these kinds of things. They were very adamant against it. And so apocryphal came basically to be a pejorative term. Um, or at least that seems to be the historical trend. Like I said, I don't have any quote in mind that I can say directly that links the Gnostics to the use of that term, but the Gnostics did de definitely have that belief in secret things, 
and the Christians definitely did respond to it, and then the Christians started using apocryphal as a pejorative term. So there is that pro uh, progression, so it seems the most probable case, but I can't be too adamant about it. But that's the probable um, genesis of how apocryphal came to be used in the early church the way that it was. It was not something that was a good thing. It was definitely a pejorative term. They didn't like it because of its association with Gnosticism. And it generally meant that something was untrue or unreliable. So, for example, the Gnostic Gospel of Thomas, which um, a lot of people would put in the se second century, um, would definitely fall within this category. It is one of the books that contains the supposedly secret teachings of Jesus. But of course, if you're an Orthodox Christian, you believe that the message of Jesus is for all. There are no secret teachings of Jesus. There was nothing that was kept secret, hidden in a way, that was not proclaimed, that was not made known, that was not readily available in one form or another. Uh, a more modern example could be the Book of Mormon. The Book of Mormon was... Uh, written by Joseph Smith. Of course, if there's any LES who are listening to me right now, they would absolutely balk at that. They would say, no, he just translated it. Well, historically, it's not possible to prove that he actually translated anything because there is nothing to that he translated from that is still extant that we can show was actually a precursor to his material. So I'm going to call him uh, the writer of it. So Joseph Smith wrote the Book of Mormon, and he claimed that it is something that had basically been unknown, it had been kept secret, it had been buried and hidden away from basically all of humanity until such a time as this. And at that moment in time, God decided to restore the true church through Joseph Smith using this hidden work. That's Gnosticism through and through in the way that it's developed and the way that it presents itself. It's very much so a Gnostic sort of belief. And it's interesting that one of the takeoffs from, not, from uh, Mormonism, led by a fellow named Archie Wood, who frankly is not the most stable person on the face of the planet, but by a fellow named Archie Wood, his group calls itself, in particular he calls it, the true Gnostic Church. Even though he's a little bit touched in the head, he can completely recognize what kind of a teaching it is, and that's exactly what it is. It is Gnosticism. It is this idea of secret and hidden things. That's what it is. And so that association and that understanding is a very important thing when we're talking about Scripture, and it's particularly if you're reading the ancients. All right, so here is a diagram showing the different categories of Scripture that Christians have had over the years. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that every church father me mentions every single one of these categories. And for example, um, Orthodox is a term that we apply in the modern to say that this is something that is Christian versus something that isn't. Early Christian fathers did not use that terminology. In fact, they were actually very inconsistent when it came to that particular group of writings just because they didn't necessarily have a word for it. You know, it's, there's these writings that are like this and these writings that are like this and then all the rest, more or less. And so they weren't very specific about it. We're being specific in retrospect. And so a lot of the ancient church fathers, you wouldn't expect to hear them talk about Orthodox scripture. The one that probably comes the closest to that is Eusebius, early 4th century uh, Christian historian. Um, there are some of his descriptions where he starts kind of listing some of the extra books and extraneous stuff, and some of the others do too. Not in a very organized fashion, though. He doesn't necessarily give everything uh, a very specific title that is broadly applicable. He has some of his own words, but very few other authors that I've read use those same words. Um, so orthodox is something that we're definitely doing in retrospect. However, canonical, ecclesiastical, and apocryphal, though, were used by the ancient church fathers and fairly often. However, they didn't always use them in the same ways. For example, some of the works that some of the church fathers would describe as ecclesiastical, some of the others would describe as being apocryphal. That is, the church knows about these works, the church uses these works, therefore they're ecclesiastical, but they're not fully reliable. They're unreliable or untrue in the absolute sense, and because of that they're apocryphal. So some books could be put in multiple categories, and that's why apocryphal um, covers both the ecclesiastical and the orthodox and actually extends past the orthodox a little bit. 
it would cover a lot of different things. Anything that you could describe as being untrue or unreliable in sense, some sense could be apocryphal. If it's used at the church at all, it could be described as ecclesiastical. If it is something that is from a basic Christian worldview, it's described as orthodox. Now, the one that we're most interested in, of course, is canonical, that which guides the faith. It's one thing to say that something is useful, to say that it's good to read, to say that it has good historical information, it has good uh, moral teachings, it helps you understand the climate of the time and what particular sayings meant in a particular context. It's one thing to say those kinds of things to saying this is the guide and the standard of the faith. This has an authority that those ones don't. And like I said, different church groups will disagree about exactly how far that authority extends, but one thing that you cannot get past is that the early authors frequently distinguished between classes of books. And as biblical historical Christians, we want the most authoritative class of books. And that is why we use canonical in the book Sword. And you'll notice that in Sword, in pretty much all of the chapters from here on out, and all of the section headings from here on out, it will not use the term Bible anymore. Instead, it is very much so. Um, very, very, very much so uh, dedicated to the idea of canonicity instead. So if you want uh, something that is uh, that has a fairly rigid definition, you want a canonical, that which has authority regarding the faith. And then we can get and we can talk about the specifics there. And I'm not saying that there isn't any gray area whatsoever. You read through the historical sources and they're not going to completely agree on this. But it is much more so fixed than the other categories are, and because of that it's a useful starting point. And it's also what biblical historical Christians would be interested in. We believe in the primacy of the canon in the primacy of scripture and so we want what is most authoritative we believe that it is the most authoritative so on and so forth all right so let's actually go and actually take a look at some of these early church fathers and the distinctions that they made this will be fairly brief i'm not going to be able to provide you with full quotations of everything there are fuller quotations in the appendix of sword um, but for the purposes of this lecture we'll just keep it fairly short we're only going to look at three of them all right, the first one is a fellow by the name of Rufinus. Rufinus is a very important early church father. Um, one, because he is fairly early. He's late 4th century, early 5th century. And so that's definitely earlier than some. Um, he also wrote quite a bit. We have quite a bit of material from him, so we have a pretty good idea of what he believed and what he didn't believe. And by the way, he wouldn't make for a very good Protestant. He also wouldn't necessarily make for a very good traditional Christian in the sense of modern traditional Christianity, although he would definitely be closer to that than modern Protestantism, which is kind of all over the place right now, unfortunately. Um, but another major reason why he is important is because he was a church father who was actually trained in the East, um, but uh, wrote from the West. And so he was actually able to represent both the Eastern and the Western view of things and note the differences and the similarities and these kinds of things. And so if you want someone who can see both sides of the issue and represent both sides of the issue, Rufinus is a good place to go. And uh, Rufinus, having been trained in the East, writing in the West, knowing both uh, groups, uh, what was believed in both areas, uh, this is what he writes. He says, but it should be known that there are also other books which our fathers call not canonical, but ecclesiastical. That is to say, and then it goes on and he lists a lot of them, um, all of which they would have read in the churches, but not appealed to for the confirmation of doctrine. The other writings they have named apocrypha, that is, unreliable or untrue, these they would not have read in the churches. So here, in a fairly short space, we have one church father who mentions all of the major categories except for orthodox and I told you orthodox is something that we back apply to that category that was kind of just out there we call it orthodox it's Christian in a basic sense but the other categories are actually historical categories that the early church fathers actually use like Rufinus he uses all three of the other ones 
here basically almost, not quite, but almost in the same breath. Canonical, ecclesiastical, and apocrypha. And these are things that were obviously well known. Uh, these are terms uh, that were in fact used. So he says there's canonical, and his version of canonical would be pretty close to Protestants. The differences we'll talk about when we start getting into the specific issues of the canon of scripture, but they're pretty close. Um, ecclesiastical would include a lot of the works that the Catholics and the Eastern Orthodox would include in their Bibles, but Protestant don't. don't. And he also mentions the uh, apocryphal works. These are the ones that we don't read in the churches. We don't uh, trust them. We don't think that they're reliable. We don't think that they're true. And what he says is particularly interesting. He says, regarding the ecclesiastical works, the church books, not the authoritative books, but the books that can be used in the church, he says, all of which they would have read in the churches. These are okay to read, but not appeal to for the confirmation of doctrine. That is, what you are to believe as a Christian does not come from these books. These can be used for the purposes of the church, and they can be used by church people, and they should even be read in the churches, but you cannot appeal to them as a source of doctrine. And this is actually something that was very similar to, the, to an admonition found in early Protestant translations of the Bible, because a lot of the early Protestant translations did include extra books that Protestants do not now include, and they would usually have a forward with them that would say, okay, now here's a class of books that Christians used, um, that they've been uh, considered to be useful, but you don't use them for the confirmation of doctrine. Almost the exact same kind of phraseology that's being used. I'm particularly thinking of uh, the 1560 Geneva Bible. The 1560 Geneva Bible has a foreword to those extra books that reads basically like that. And of course, their idea was not new. Rufinus had said basically the same thing hundreds of years before. Actually, almost, uh, actually more than a full millennium before which is interesting. So this is actually the way that early church fathers talk. They would talk about it in levels. There was the most authoritative, something that could be used, but it wasn't authoritative in the formal sense, and then stuff that was outside of that. All right, here's another one. This is from Athanasius. Athanasius writes a little bit earlier, 367 AD. His view still makes a lot of distinctions, but he doesn't believe that the ecclesiasticals are quite as useful as Rufinus does. Rufinus is much more accepting of them, but he just he basically said he keeps it at uh, keeps them away from doctrine. You can use them, but just don't use them as a basis for doctrine. Athanasius is a little bit more conservative regarding the ecclesiasticals than that. This is what he says. But for greater exactness, I add this also, writing of necessity, that there are other books besides these not indeed included in the canon, but appointed by the fathers to be read by those who new, newly join us and who wish for instruction in the word of godliness. Athanasius then lists a lot of these non-canonical works, but the former, that is the canonical works, are included in the canon. Uh, but the former, that is the canonical works, my brethren, are included in the canon, these latter being merely read. Nor is there in any place a mention of apocryphal writings. So again, we get that trifle distinction going on. You have the most authoritative, the canon. You have ones that are used by church people, and Athanasius is actually really specific about the context in which they're used. They're used for catechumens. They're used for new people as a means of instruction. Just like uh, Protestants today will use a lot of particular works to help introduce people to Christianity and what the Christian life is about and all these kinds of things. Well, they were doing it back then. They were just doing it with a different set of works, different context, different set of works. But at the end, he still adds this, uh, this distinction. He says, but the former my brethren are included in the canon these latter being merely read. So there's the canon, there's this authoritative thing, the degree of authority that it has, people can argue about. Athanasius is actually pretty big on the authority of scripture, uh, but some people argue that. Um, but he definitely makes a distinction here. Here's the canon. This is something that's not really questioned. But these latter ones are merely read, is kind of an extra emphasis. They're just read, 
merely as something that's added to the translation to try to get the point across. But it's red. This is what's red, but these others are in the canon. And then he goes on to say, and there's not a mention anywhere of apocryphal writings. That is, there's not a mention of anywhere of these secrets or lost books or these hidden uh, sayings of Jesus. Nothing like that. No. What is the Orthodox faith? The Orthodox faith is the faith that was to go to all. It is not elitist. It is for everyone. Go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. Whoever is who believes and is baptized will be saved. That is basically the summation of the Orthodox faith. Go into the world and make disciples. Not pick and choose which ones you really like and only teach them the, my secret sayings. And the others you can teach the general sayings. But find the secret sayings. No, nothing like that. Okay, but here again we have that distinction. But whereas Rufinus allowed the ecclesiasticals to be used basically uh, uh, as a regular part of the church, Athanasius here is a little bit more specific. He says it's for those who newly join us, which basically means, as far as having to do it, what you would consider to be the normative use of it, it would basically be a once-in-a-lifetime kind of thing, which isn't to say you couldn't go back and reread them, but it is expected for people who newly join. Um, as introductory material, and that actually comes out of the Jewish custom, uh, which would, which actually had a catechumen process of its own. If you were not born a Jew, there'd be a lot of things that you wouldn't know about Jewish uh, culture and Jewish customs, so on and so forth. And so they had their own set of writings um, that they would use to introduce people to what it meant to be Jewish, to what it meant to be Hebrew. And the Christians actually used a lot of those same writings, adopted them and borrowed them and used them for practically the same purpose. And that's what we have here with Athanasius. Another writing that is also important to note and is uh, that of Cyril of Jerusalem. Cyril of Jerusalem is interesting because, for one, he is one of the more Eastern Church Fathers. Whether or not he would be considered Eastern Church Father in the sense of Eastern Orthodox is a little bit interesting because Jerusalem which was one of the original sees of Christianity, um, was actually uh, divorced from Christianity. Um, later on, it kind of fell by the wayside and out of the way. And so whether or not Cyril represents Eastern uh, Christianity that would later develop or not is actually a little bit of a, a disputable matter. But nonetheless, he does represent early Christianity, and he represents uh, one of the earliest sees of Christianity. And this is what he had to say about the matter. He says, learn also diligently and from the church what are the books of the Old Testament and what are those of the New. And pray, read none of the apocryphal writings. For why do you, who know not those which are acknowledged among all, trouble yourself in vain about those which are disputed? That is an interesting statement. When you actually read through the rest of what Cyril has to say, his version of the Old Testament and the New Testament is pretty similar to what Protestants have, except that he didn't accept the Book of Revelation. And there's actually a few, quite a few other Eastern Church Fathers who did, uh, who were the same in that. And there's a historical reason as to why Revelation was not preferred in the East, and we'll get into that in later chapters. But for now, what's important to note is that Cyril doesn't make the trifle distinction that Rufinus and Athanasius did. Rufinus and Athanasius said, okay, there's canonical, there's another class of writings that are read, there are ecclesiasticals, and then after that there's apocryphal. But for Cyril, there's just two categories. There's what the church uses, the Old and New Testament, and then there's the disputed stuff, the apocryphal stuff, the unreliable stuff. And those are the only distinctions for him. He doesn't say that they're necessarily um, bad. But his question is, well, if you don't know what is good and bad about them, then why trouble yourself? Then why trouble yourself in vain about them? Okay, these are disputed, is what he says. And at the time that Cyril wrote, and from other fourth-century writings and other early writings and a little bit later writings, uh, you definitely do get that view that there was uh, some dispute about those other books. And Cyril says, well, if you want to be safe, go with what. Um, go with basically with the canonical writings. We know that those are safe. And so I find that rather interesting. And he is in Jerusalem. I mean, if there's any sea of Christianity that I don't know what's going on, you would think it would be Jerusalem. And this is actually a fairly uh, typical point of view of a lot of Protestants. 
Um, that is that when it comes right down to it, um, yeah, the other stuff might have some useful information in it and whatnot, and it might not necessarily be bad, but at the same time, if it isn't canonical, if it isn't authoritative, if it doesn't properly belong to the Old and New Testament, then why really bother? It's a fair point. So these are distinctions that were known in their early church uh, writings, um, and they're uh, distinctions that are important to keep in mind today. Most of the differences that occur between Bibles are differences that have to do with the ecclesiasticals. But even early on, they were very careful to distinguish between the ecclesiasticals and the canonical works. And sometimes the, the difference between apocryphal and ecclesiastical kind of got blurred a little bit from time to time. But still, there was still a very, very much so a separated idea of this is authoritative, this isn't. Sometimes it might be useful, but it's not necessarily authoritative like that group over there is. And that's what we're trying to hone in on here. If you want what is most authoritative, you need to be talking about canonical and not the other categories. All right, section one, two. We're going to tackle that one question that in the book I spend quite a bit more time on, but here I'm not going to spend a ton of time on it. It's the question of, isn't the primacy of the canon a recently created doctrine? And we're going to address that with a single quote from Augustine. Now, Augustine was a 4th fourth, um, fourth and 5th century early church father, at least fairly early. And this is what he had to say about the whole issue of the doctrine of the primacy of the canon. And in case you're wondering what I mean by primacy of the canon, it's basically what a lot of Protestants would know as sola scriptura. That is scripture alone. When it comes to the, the chief authority of the faith, Protestants believe that it is the written word which foremost should uh, bind us. Um, it would be somewhat similar to those who in America believe that the formal binding uh, source of authority for the nation should be um, the Constitution. They call themselves constitutionalists. Same thing uh, for Protestants, more or less. We believe that the written word is the binding authority. And this is what Augustine, a very early church father, had to say about this. He said, Wherefore, my brother, refrain from gathering together against divine testimonies, testimonies the calumnies which may be found in the writings of bishops either of our communion as Hilary or of the undivided church itself in the age preceding the schism of Donatus as Cyprian or Agrippinus. Because in the first place this class of writings must be, so far as authority is concerned, distinguished from the canon of scripture. For they are not read by us as if a testimony brought forward from them was such that it would be unlawful to hold any different opinion. Now, there are a few things to bear in mind about this quote from Augustine. First of all, Augustine had a different view of the canon than most Protestants did. His was a little bit more expansive. He was from the Western tradition. The Western tradition tended not to distinguish between the books as much and would call a lot of pretty much all of the books canonical because they used it in the church and that might as well be the standard. And in some sense, you can you can see where that comes from. It's not necessarily. Um, a completely unprecedented idea, but his idea of the canon was larger than ours, and that distinction is something we're going to have to address. Also, Augustine would be pretty traditional in a lot of ways. Uh, if Augustine walked into the average Protestant church, he wouldn't recognize it, frankly, and even if he went into a lot of the more conservative ones, he probably wouldn't recognize it. That's worth noting. But at the same time, what he says here is still very important to that whole question of whether or not the doctrine of sola scriptura is this recent invention. The idea of should we trust these writings over what the church has to say or over what tradition has to say or any combination thereof. And what does he say? He says that the divine testimonies, that the canon of scripture stands above all of these other sources. We could talk about the bishops of the churches through the ages. We could talk about Hillary. We could talk about Cyprian or Agrippinus. But what does he say? 
he says that as far as authority is concerned, they are to be distinguished from the canon of Scripture. Moreover, he says they are not read by us as if a testimony brought forward from them was such that it would be unlawful to hit, hold any different opinion. What does that mean? It means he didn't consider the standing tradition of the church to be authoritative. It wasn't necessarily binding. What he said is that the canon supersedes all of this other stuff. That's the doctrine of the primacy of the canon. That's sola scriptura, at least in the basic sense. So is it something new that Martin Luther came up with when he nailed his 95 Theses to the Wittenberg church door? No. you got to remember that a lot of the reformers were actually pretty well informed people, pretty well studied and lettered. They re had read a lot of the early church fathers. They knew what these people had said and they said, this is something that I can support historically. So Luther's uh, and later reformers' popularization of Sola Scriptura wasn't uh, a creation of something new. It was just simply a popularization of an idea that was already present, as this Augustine quote shows. And if you go through and you actually read the large print edition of Sword, uh, you'll see that there's actually lots of church fathers who made very similar mentions um, that could just as easily be interpreted that way. This doesn't necessarily mean that every early church father was a sola scriptura Christian. That doesn't mean that at all. A lot of them were actually horribly inconsistent when it came to how they uh, defended the faith and defined the faith and those kinds of things. They would often have one set of standards for things that came from outside their particular worldview and their particular tradition, and then another standard for things that were inside. And some of them that have these ringing affirmations of the authority of scripture turn around and also have these ringing affirmations of tradition. And there will be places where they actually refute a tradition on the basis of scripture because it's a tradition that comes from outside of their worldview. But if it's a tra tradition that's within their worldview, they don't bother comparing it to scripture because they don't think that they're wrong or that they could be wrong. And that really is the difference between Protestantism and the traditional churches. Isn't so much whether or not you trust scripture above everything else. Because for a traditional Christian, if you have something that's coming from outside the faith, you would definitely consider scripture to be more than sufficient to refute it. For example, if someone has said that, you know, Jesus hated children or something like that, you could point to incidents in the Gospels that um, those famous words, kind of old-timey words, but those famous words, suffer the little children to come unto me, that means allow the little children to come unto me, that's one of the things that's recorded in the Gospel, and you could say, no, that's not true because Scripture says otherwise. And most traditional Christians wouldn't bat an eye at doing something like that. The question is whether or not you're willing to apply it within the system and also without. Most traditional Christians are willing to apply scripture as a standard outside of the system, but they're not all willing to apply it inside of the, script, and the system. Protestants are, are at least supposed to be, not that they always do this, but they're at least supposed to apply it outside and inside. And that was what led to the Reformation. People saying, this doesn't match up. This is inherently contradictive. This needs to be changed. We need to change ourselves. We need to be reformed. This isn't right. We need to make it right. That was the whole idea. It wasn't whether or not Scripture could be used as a standard. It was whether or not you could take that standard of Scripture and apply it to your own tradition. If you could apply it to what you happen to and believe, not just to outside beliefs, but to your own beliefs, and be willing to be guided by that. And that's what uh, Protestants uh, basically defines the Protestant Reformation, is that willingness to question your own tradition and admit we might have gotten it wrong, and the way that we would know that we got it wrong is if it doesn't match up with Scripture. And that is essentially what Augustine is saying here. You can read the book for the full quote, and it go well, a fuller quote. I mean, Augustine wrote quite a bit, but a fuller quote. And it goes on basically to say that um, 
what has been recorded in the church since the time of the writings of the canon of scripture have not necessarily always been the truth. Just because a Christian wrote it doesn't make it true. Just because the majority of Christians believed it doesn't make it true. Just because it was affirmed by ecumenical councils doesn't make it true. The question isn't what has been come to be accepted. The question is what was laid down at the beginning. That is the difference between the traditional point of view and the Protestant point of view. The traditional point of view is perfectly okay with this is what has come to be accepted. The Protestant point of view is says, was that what was actually taught and understood to be the case from the first? And there were early Christians who were saying we should go back to first standards, like Augustine. Was he entirely consistent on every point? Was he well researched in every particular aspect? Did he know all of the issues going into the canon of scripture that he accepted and all this? Maybe not. Although he wasn't necessarily an idiot either. He wrote some pretty um, amazingly intelligent stuff. I, I wouldn't necessarily say that. He was completely uninformed in every regard. That would definitely be a um, uh, that would be definitely be a misnomer. But we could ask whether or not he's consistent in what he believes. And if he isn't consistent, then there would be reason not to trust him in those points of inconsistency, at the very least. But here he is being consistent. He says we should go to the first standard. That first standard is the canon of scripture. It's not the later stuff. Very consistent testimony at this point, perfectly in accord with Sola Scriptura, it is not a recent invention. It was something that was known to Christians throughout history. The question is whether or not they consistently applied that standard or not. And even Protestants today are not very good at consistently applying the standard. We say that we're sola scriptura, but frankly there's lots of Protestants who don't always apply the biblical standards within their own groups or even to their own lives. They're kind of Protestant in name only. Nominal Protestantism. They don't actually get what it means to be Protestant in that sense. They're Protestants out of convenience, not because they've actually really given a whole lot of thought to it and actually are dedicated to it. And that's always the distinction between convenient faith and genuine faith. I could wax philosophical on that forever, so let's move on. All right, so moving on. Uh, next question is, what is the definition of the canon? I'm, I'm breaking this down into two basic parts. The early definition... Um, and then what definition we're using here, and I'll explain a little bit of why. And that's what we're going to go through in talking about actually what the canon is. So we've seen that there is this historical distinction with the canon. There is this set of writings over here that is authoritative. How authoritative it is depends on the group that you're talking about. For Protestants, it is the most authoritative thing. And then there are groups of writings that have lesser authority. Well, what we're interested in is that group that has the highest authority. Why does it have the highest authority? How do you know it belongs to that group? Um, how do you know it is in the canon and that this other thing isn't in the canon? So on and so forth. That's what we're going to be talking about in this section. All right, so the definition. You can find this on page 13 of the large print edition of S.W.O.R.D. Uh, says, the canon is composed of the written record deriving from the prophets and the Lord's apostles. That basic description, this is a paraphrase, of course, but that basic description you can find in a lot of the early church fathers, all, all the way up into the 5th century. You can actually find it even in scripture. Second Peter chapter 3, verses 1 and 2 basically says it. It doesn't say the canon necessarily, but it says that it is from these people in particular that you have your most authoritative things. And depending on how you translate the words and what contextual references you use, it would most seem uh, it would be most directly re referring to written documents, uh, and that certainly seems to be how it got interpreted by later church fathers like Justin Martyr, Clement of Alexandria, John Chrysostom, Augustine of Hippo, uh, and so forth. So this is a definition that was known pretty early on. If it's a part of the canon, if it's what we're going to consider authoritative, it has to derive from the prophets and the Lord's apostles. That's how you know what's in and what isn't. Now, when you break that down, especially in light of the rest of what Scripture has to say about it, uh, you could actually be a little bit more specific than that. In particular, 
um, that definition of coming from the Lord's prophets and apostles can be broken down into three parts. The first part of which is authority. The second part is agreement. And then the last part is authenticity. This slide here has to do with authority. Okay. That is, who is it that wrote, wrote it is a chief concern. And it is the chief concern. And it has to come from the prophets and apostles. We already said that earlier. It's mentioned in Second Peter chapter three, verses one and two. You have a very similar statement in Ephesians chapter two, nineteen through twenty, and this is predicated upon particular definitions that are given in the Bible in the Old Testament, particularly um, in Deuteronomy chapter thirteen and in chapter eighteen. You have fairly specific requirements that are given of what a prophet is and what a prophet isn't. How do you know who a prophet is? Well. Here's the criteria by how you can know. This is how you know this person has the right authority and how you know that they don't have the right authority. In the New Testament, we also have a definition of authority given to the apostles. We have that they're designated apostles by Christ. That's in Luke 6.13. Um, we have that they are the ones who are to publish the gospel, to use the words of Tertullian. That kind of a reference can be found in John 15, 26 through 27. And that that was understood to be limited to a particular group of people who had special access to Jesus during his ministry, going all the way back to the time of the baptism of John, and that we find in Acts chapter 1, specifically verses 21 through 26. So these are particular people who have special authority and whose roles are very well defined so that you can distinguish who is and who isn't. All right, so to be more specific in the Old Testament, it's the prophet that is the main person there. And so you know that it's a part of the Old Testament if it was written by a prophet, compiled or consolidated from the writings of a prophet, or prophets as the case may be. There might have been more than one prophet behind a particular writing, and or composed under the implicit authority of a prophet. So it doesn't necessarily have to be the direct writing of a prophet, but as long as the prophet is the source and a relatively faithful transmission, it counts. In the New Testament, we would say that it was authored by an ear, or, uh, sorry, an eye, or ear witness of Christ with the implicit approval of at least one of Christ's legal representatives. That is, one of the twelve apostles, one of those peoples that was given that special authority, has to be behind it in some way, shape, or form. This doesn't mean that every writing in the New Testament actually comes from one of the twelve apostles. That just simply isn't the case. But it does mean that their authority is behind those writings in one shape or form, in one way, shape, or form. So that's the first part of this definition. If we're saying that these writings are the writings of the prophets and the apostles, the first part of that definition obviously has to be the prophets and the apostles. How do we know what a prophet is? How do we know what an apostle is? Prophets, you read in Deuteronomy chapters 13 and 18. To figure out what an apostle is, you can look through the New Testament, but pr primarily Acts chapter 1 is what you'd be looking at. And then you figure out what the understanding of these particular groups are, and then you can apply it to each testament that they apply to. Prophets to the Old Testament, apostles to the New Testament. doesn't necessarily have to be direct, but it has to be from a reasonable measure from. Fairly close. All right, the next part of that would be agreements. That is, it is one thing to claim that it's from the prophets and apostles, but you have to have a decent reason to believe that it actually is from uh, the prophets and apostles. And there's two, ba uh, two basic things that would help you give you reason to believe that it's from the prophets and apostles. The first one is that what they've said is in agreement with previously established canonical scripture. That is, if this really is God's prophet, you wouldn't expect him to suddenly contradict everything that was said before. If he does contradict everything that was said before, that either means that God can't keep his story straight, or he's not a prophet. And in the Judeo-Christian worldview, God is God, he knows who he is, he can keep his own story straight, so the person who is contradicting what came first is the one who must be an heir. And so if they're contradicting what was previously given, they're wrong. And this is something that is actually mentioned in canonical scripture. 
um, as being the way that you check and see if things are actually uh, true, way that you actually check and see if these things are actually right. For example, in the Old Testament, in Isaiah 8.20, this is in the Masoretic text, uh, it doesn't read quite the same way in the Septuagint, but it says, to the law and the prophets, if anyone does not speak according to these, uh, they have no light, they have no dawn, um, they're wrong, basically. Uh, Malachi 4.4 4 admonishes the people to go back to the words of Moses. It says, yeah, what was delivered at first was right. And I affirm what was said at first as being right. There was no, well, something was lost or it was mistranslated or this or that or the other thing. Instead it was, you know it's right, you know what the history says, and you know whether or not I'm speaking in accordance with that history, and I'm admonishing you to go back to that and actually do what it tells you to do. And we also get the same thing in the New Testament. Luke uh, 24, 44 is a, uh, a verse of paramount importance, um, especially for Protestants, but just in general theology, but especially for Protestants. Why? Because Jesus explains himself, his ministry, him as the Messiah, in terms of the Old Testament scriptures. He goes back and he talks to them in the terms of the law, in the terms of the prophets, in the terms of the Psalms. He goes back and he actually says, what I'm doing was foretold that I would do this. He establishes himself as being in keeping with the canonical scriptures. And Jesus further in John 10.35 says that scripture cannot be uh, broken, it cannot be undone, it cannot be nullified. That is, no one can come back later and say, well, that doesn't matter. It does matter. They have to do what the scripture says. They have to teach what the scripture says to teach, so on and so forth. It cannot be undone. It cannot be nullified. So if they actually are from the same God, you expect them to have the same message over time, essentially. And that is uh, one of the implicit um, requirements for believing that this person actually is a prophet or actually is an apostle. So in the specific case of the Old Testament, that means that it does not teach anything obviously false or contrary to the Torah. That is the first five books of the Old Testament, which are accepted by all Hebrew and Christian groups. Uh, Torah might be kind of a, a strange name for some people. Some people might know it as the Pentateuch, but it's the first five books of the Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. So the Old Testament works that come after have to agree with those five. Those ones were the ones that were first revealed. So if you're going to believe in that God, you have to be kept, uh, keep going back to those. They have to be in agreement with those ones. In the case of the New Testament, this is already after the time of the Old Testament, so that means it does not teach anything obviously false or contrary to the Old Testament canon, which is basically the 39... Old Testament books accepted by evangelicals. And I put the basically in there. It's not actually in the book, but I put the basically in there because there are some books that are commonly accepted by Protestants and evangelicals, uh, and specifically evangelicals. It's a little bit more specific than Protestant because some Protestant groups are actually somewhat okay with the Apocrypha. Um, but I put the basically in there because there are a couple of books in the general Protestant evangelical canon that are a little bit debatable. And there's only a couple, literally two. There's one in the Old Testament, Esther, and then there's one in the New Testament, which is the book of Revelation. And exactly why those ones are disputed and whether or not those disputes are valid or not, we'll discuss at a later point. But don't get too fixated on it, because all of these dev definitions have a certain amount of fuzziness to them, but there's still something behind them. And this is what we're talking about that's behind it, that idea of there being a prophet behind it or an apostle behind it. And that those prophets and apostles would actually be teaching in agreement with what came before them. They wouldn't be contradicting themselves. This is um, an example for why um, Protestants do not accept uh, Mormonism. We do not consider Mormonism to be a part of Protestantism. Mormonism is a part of post-Protestantism. It occurs after Protestantism. It is not a part of us. It is its own little thing. They claim to be Christian, but they are not Christian in the, sen in the orthodox sense um, because they violate that principle of God's consistency, that God's messengers speak with consistency. 
across time in a way that is actually verifiable. You can actually look for consistency and find it. In Mormonism, you don't have that. One of their chief teachings about the Bible is that it is correct so far as it is, uh, as it is translated correctly. It's basically, it's only correct as so much as we say it's correct is basically what it comes down to. They believe that there were plain and precious things that were lost from the biblical account. And because of that, what they say is not in agreement with the biblical account. And they don't feel a need to be in agreement with the biblical account. But we would say that if we're going to trust your people in writing your works, like Joseph Smith writing the Book of Mormon, we would say that it has to be in agreement with what was first revealed, otherwise you have an inconsistent God. If we know what was said at the first and we can be reasonably sure of what was said, and you're saying something different, that means you're wrong. And of course they would say, well, it was lost. It originally did say this, but then it got lost. But the problem is we don't have any historical evidence to say that those particular things that they say it used to teach were actually taught in it. We don't have any historical evidence for that whatsoever. At least not to any considerable extent. This whole issue of agreement is a big deal for Christians. And it doesn't matter what kind of a Christian you are, if you're a Protestant, if you're Catholic, if you're Eastern Orthodox or whatever, the idea of agreement, of God being able to give a consistent revelation that is historically investigable, that you can actually hold him accountable to history and say, this is what you've done in the past, and now you're contradicting yourself, you're not really from God, is a big deal. Mormonism? completely violates that. And there's other groups that do it too. Islam is like that as well. Well, the previous revelations have become corrupted. A lot of uh, Muslims believe that. The previous uh, ones have been corrupted, and only the Quran is uncorrupted. Well, that makes your God out to be inconsistent. It means he is not historically investigable. There is no falsifiability there. I have to take your prophet's word for it that he's a true prophet. I can't hold him accountable to a standard of agreement because he denies it. Which in and of itself would be that he is not in agreement. Which is why Orthodox Christians do not accept works like the Quran or the Book of Mormon. You have denied falsifiability. If it is not falsifiable, you don't have any good reason to believe that it's true. It's as simple as that. So this is one reason for saying that this person actually is a prophet that claims to be a prophet, or this person actually is an apostle that claims to be an apostle. They're teaching in agreement with what they claim to be coming from. The other major reason for believing that they are who they claim to be, that it actually is from a prophet or that it actually is from an apostle, is the whole issue of authenticity. That is, is it historically authentic? And this isn't necessarily a great revelation. I mean, and when it comes to prophet and apostle, those are defined in the Bible very well. And when it comes to that issue of agreements, you have specific references in the Old Testament and in the New Testament saying that what people had to teach had to be in agreement with what was previously taught and those kinds of things. This one is actually pretty general. This is more of a common sense, no-duh kind of thing which the Bible also does talk about, uh, specifically in Proverbs 14.15 and Proverbs 35-6. Uh, through 6. Um, Proverbs 14.15 in particularly is one of my favorites because what it basically says is that the simple or the naive will believe anything. But a prudent man, the wise man, gives thought to his steps. That is... Naive and stupid people will believe just about anything that you tell them. It is a mark of wisdom to actually search it out. Okay, so here's a work that claims to be a work of scripture. It claims to be from the Apostle Thomas, or whoever it might claim to be. And some people would say, oh yeah, this must be true. Because obviously it claims to be from Thomas. So, And it is an ancient work, so you know it, it could be valid. Well, the prudent person, the wise person, would look at that and say, well, maybe, but let's actually look into it and actually see if that is a historically authentic, uh, authentic claim, if we have a good reason for actually believing that that's the case. 
Okay. And Proverbs 35 through 6 speaks to this in that it talks about um, God finding people out to be liars. That is, that um, God has a way, historically speaking, and personally as well, but also through history, of proving things to be false, of proving liars to be liars. And when it comes to those kinds of things, it's good to wait. Time will tell, as the saying goes. And sometimes you will, <laughs> things will be proved to be false. And so it's not good to be eager to accept things just because people say that you should. Can you actually verify that it's historically authentic? Is it what it actually claims to be? Do you have good reason to believe that it is what it claims to be? So how does this actually get lived out in the Testaments? Eh, well, it's pretty basic. For uh, the Old Testament and New Testament, we basically say it cannot be historically proven to be untruthful or spurious and is well supported in the historical record. And that last part, being well supported in the historical record, is especially important. That is, if they say that it was a part of the Bible from the first, and it was a part of this historical time frame, you would expect it actually to get mentioned in history. If it doesn't, then the odds are either it didn't exist or nobody cared about it enough to mention it. In either case, there's not a good argument for its historical authenticity. It's an important thing. The biblical documents that we do have are well known throughout history. A lot of the ones that aren't well known don't make it into the Bible. Why? Because their historical authenticity is dubious at best. Is it possible that there are works out there that um, could possibly be authentic but are not included in the canon today? In the hypothetical sense it is, I don't necessarily believe that's the case. I haven't found a good candidate for it, certainly. But at least hypothetically, that could be the case. But if you have to err on one side or the other, which one would you want to err on? Would you want to include something that might possibly be authentic but, and run the risk of basically believing something that is incorrect? Or would you want to restrict yourself only to those things that you are very sure of being correct and prevent yourself from believing things that might possibly be false? There are arguments on either side. If you're a traditional Christian, you would typically err more so on the other side, saying, well, it's better to include it than not include it. If you're a Protestant, you would uh, say, well, it's better to exclude it than rather believe, some, uh, than rather believe something that is incorrect. And where you come out on that, well, that's ultimately going to be your own decision. But I'm a Protestant. I believe that it's better to be sure of what you have than to be possibly sure of what you might have. So, that's the first chapter. Some definitions of the different classes of scripture. Um, that whole issue of sola scriptura, of the primacy of the canon, that is, that whole issue of saying that the canon is the authoritative standard of the faith and defining it basically as such. It's what has authority regard, what, uh, it's what has ultimate authority. It does need to be something that is historically tenable, and it is. That doesn't mean that every historical Christian believed it, and not that every historical Christian consistently applied it, but it is definitely found in the historical system. Uh, statements well before you get to the Protestant Reformation. And then finally this, the definition. What is the canon? How do you know if it belongs or if it doesn't? Well, the definition is pretty simple. It comes from a prophet or apostle. And if it does come from a prophet or apostle, truly, we'd expect that what they would say would be in agreement, and that it would also satisfy the condition of historical authenticity. So authority, agreement, and authenticity is how we know if it's in the canon or not, basically. All right, so that's chapter one. Thank you guys very much for listening. I know that I run off into random tangents all over the place, and this first chapter is definitely not the most organized chapter in the world. It's For a lot of people, it would probably be pretty hard to figure out how all these different things link together. And part of it is just, this is preliminary information that you need to know before we go on to the rest of the book. Part of it is just that. But there is actually a theme that runs through it. That is, we start out by defining uh, the key term that we're going to be using, and that is canon. It's what has authority regarding the faith. 
that idea of written works being the authority of the faith, being his, something that's historically founded. The primacy of the canon is there in history. And then being able to say exactly what we mean by that canon, the specific definition of authority, um, agreement, and authenticity. There is a theme that runs through this. Basically, why is it that the canon is such a big deal? And hopefully, it's kind of a roundabout way, but hopefully, in listening to this, people who have not necessarily given a lot of thought to it will hopefully have given more thought to it and to their own position regarding it. Does that mean that everyone who listens to this is suddenly going to become a biblical historical Christian? Probably not. But at least, hopefully, they'll be more aware of the issue than they were before and will have given it more serious thought and consideration than they did before. So I thank you very much for your time. And for those of you who are in Christ, go with God and be blessed.